what I wanted to start with is, you know, you've checked off like 10 bucket lists worth of stuff already. And yeah. yet you're, you're still considered one of the hardest working musicians in, in, uh, currently, uh, working. And so I'm c curious what continues to drive you and what are the next goals? Well, I think I'm just born and wired this way. You know what I mean? That's just like, uh, some people are just born hot and engines revving, no brakes on the cars, you know, uh, a rocket ship with endless gasoline. And, uh, I've always had a tremendous amount of energy. And I just naturally am drawn to action, you know, excitement, the sense of, uh, you know, creating a goal uh, or creating a plan, executing the plan to reach that goal. And that's why even through this whole COVID-19 horrible experience we're going through, I literally have lists of things I'm going to do. I have a list of things that I've been trying to do for a couple of years, you know, you know, mm. like a, a book. I, I wrote a second book two years ago and I didn't release it. Now I have new ideas to put into it. So that's something I could take care of. No, you know, okay. stay, I, I'm driven, you know, I'm just naturally driven. So it's endless. Uh, I'll be that guy till I die, always being motivated and get off on executing, you know, plans that I create. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, speaking of books, you know, you, I was going through your autobiography and first off, I'm, I'm curious in the process of putting your autobiography together, what did you learn that you didn't know before you started that project? I'll never do that again. No, <laughs> well, I mean, somebody talked me into doing it. I was being interviewed for, uh, I'd been on tour with chicken foot. And they were doing an, uh, a book on Joe Satriani, and they wanted me to, to talk about Joe. And and then the guy says, man, we should do your autobiography. Well, the guy described it like, oh, man, we just talk once every two weeks, and then we put it together, and then you get the Oscar. I went, oh, that's easy. <laughs> well, it took four years, four and a half years. First of all, as he started writing and I started getting the stuff back, I went, God that doesn't sound like me. That's not hmm. me. No, that's not the way it went. I'm like, whoa, whoa. So then I eventually, moving forward, I get, I have to get John Mellencamp to, I mean, for the viewers that want to know, this is, the book's called Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll. I called it that because Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, the hardest hitting man in showbiz. The reason, the reason why I picked that title is I just love the sound of sex, drums, as opposed to sex, drugs, rock and roll. It just sounds cool. And that's yeah. a kind of a, 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 you know, in the rock and roll world, I mean, that's kind of a phrase. It means, yeah. you know, basically sex, drums, rock and roll means let's have a good time. Let's rock, you know, like, yeah. hey, <laughs> you know. And so, of course, my mom said, I cannot believe you called it that. I said, <laughs> well, it could could have been sex, drugs, rock and roll. And then the, the, uh, the publisher but Kenny, uh, the first word in the title is sex. Is this <laughs> book about sex? I went, no. Well, then why is it the first? I said, because I like the sound of the title. So at the beginning of the book, I, if I had, actually I have the book over there, but it's kind of cool. I do a disclaimer. It's kind of like, first thing I say is, look, if, you, if, you, if you're reading this book and expecting this book about to be about sex and drugs, or me having sex with 3,000 women in, you know, the period of so many years, this is not the book. You're right. If you're looking for the book where we got cocaine on the tables and chicks dressed up in nurse outfits, this right. is not the book. <laughs> I had to clarify that. It's basically yeah. about, it's basically about a, a, a kid that saw the Beatles when I was 10 years old on TV, the Ed Sullivan Show. I'm completely flipped out. And, you know, I asked my mom to call the Beatles up to get me in the Beatles because I want to be part of that. I didn't know what else to say. And when right. she didn't call the Beatles up, I, I immediately started <laughs> my own band. I started my own band called the Alley Cats. And the point of that is that I realized that that was what I want to do. That was my purpose in life. 
And that came from a place in my heart, not in my brain. Because, you know, words are ideas. Uh, and, 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 and feelings are the truth. Feelings are who you are. And, the, and, and, and who you are and feelings is you being and inside there, which is in your heart, is who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. That's your purpose in life. Basically, I'll, I ask people when I give a, do my speaking business, I'll say basically, but I, am I allowed to swear on this thing? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So basically, I basically say to people like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. Seriously. What are you fucking doing in this little life? I mean, if you haven't, <laughs> if you haven't thought about it, you better start thinking about it because this is all we know. So to get the most value out of life, everybody has to realize why they are fucking here. Mm -hmm. What is your purpose? What, do you, what is it that makes you tick? Because when you realize who you are and what your purpose is, you'll be unstoppable, you'll be undeniable, and you'll be 100% authentic. You'll be you. Nobody can yeah. say to me, nobody can say to me when I say, man, I feel that way. I feel this way about this. And they go, no, you don't. I go, are you fucking <laughs> I just told I just told you I feel this way. Right. <laughs> this is what I feel. I am mm -hmm. this. So anyway, that book is about me realizing what my purpose is way before I even understood what that meant. I'm mm -hmm. looking back at my and when I read wrote the book on like, oh my God, my mom, I wanted to be in the Beatles. I was electrified. I was like, I, I didn't know what to do. I was scratching at the walls. So when my mom said, no, I can't call the Beatles, I went, yes, I'm going to start my own band and I'm going to play the Beatles. In other words, that was so me that mm. I took action. I did something. I didn't just say, oh, I, because once you say no, once you say no, you're not in the game anymore. Yeah. You just, you're, you're not even in the, on the field to play. So I went, well, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start my own band. And all I could afford was a snare drum and a cymbal. And I stood up and played. And, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and the rest is history, of course. And the, the beautiful right. thing about this story is that 50 years later, 50, I get called to be on a CBS special called The Night That Changed America, honoring the Beatles for that Ed Sullivan show. And now I get to play with the two remaining Beatles, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, 50 years later. I mean, woo! So, yeah, I remember watching so, that. Yeah, that was, forget about it. But uh, but my, let's back to the book. So yeah. I, it, when I'm writing the book, it's my life story. It's very, first of all, the publisher said, for all those people listening, most people can tell their story in 20 pages. Mm -hmm. To get a book deal is not easy because yeah. there's got to be more to it than I played with this person, I played with that person, I did this, I did that. Now, obviously, I mean, I've, I've recorded on over 300 million records sold, 1,300 gold, platinum, diamond records. Uh, yeah. I played, I, I broke all the molds and styles playing with Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christophson, Wayne Jennings. But then also I played with, you know, Smashing Pumpkins and then obviously the Mellencamps and the Alton Johns, but then Tony O'Neill from Sabbath, but then, then Celine Dion, uh, the Be Leonard Bernstein with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I mean, I've done all that, all that stuff. Yeah. You know, and so there's a story there, but the main thing about the story is how did I do that? Because it doesn't matter if it's music or it's sports or it's science or it's uh, a, a medicine or lawyer or whatever. It's how did somebody become so accomplished in any field? What 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 makes that human being do that? That's well, what I think the book I'll... is about. And I think the other thing, the other big takeaway for me for the book, you know, because. <sighs> People, as, uh, uh, especially in the music business, are 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 often sold, packaged as being naturally gifted, as being you know just born and endowed with a certain talent, and maybe some of them are. But what I thought was interesting was in all these different steps in your journey through the book, you every time you take a leap to the next level, whether it's college, whether it's you know recording, you're always like 
kind of a little behind the guys who are already there. It's not like you were Mr. Gifted and had it easy every yeah. time. In fact, it always seemed like you no, know, any time you moved up another rung on the ladder, you had another huge uh, uh, gap to, to, to overcome. And, you know, so that's part of what makes the story compelling to me is just the whole story of perseverance. Um, and is that innate to you? And does it ever turn off? Because uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem like it does. Well, I have a phrase that I came up with, which kind of sort of sums up what you just said. And what you said is absolutely 100% right. I wasn't born the most talented guy. I wasn't, you know, the, you know. I saw it in sports because I was a jock. And, I mean, I said, guys, you know, they just, you know, they just get up with a bat and hit a home run every time, like Babe right. Ruth, drunk, <laughs> drunk, smoking a cigar. Ah! Right. And I'm sitting there going, like, okay, okay, all right, breathe deeply, all right, move this foot here, drop the shoulder, uh, suck your chest, and uh, you know, I have to think about it. These guys go, hey, baby, how you doing? Oh, boom. Right. I mean, so the phrase goes like this. I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. Hmm. I mean, that's me. It's like it's like a running back in football. We all know the great running backs. Do they get a touchdown every time they get the ball? Hell no. Mm -hmm. But they spend the rest of their life or their career trying to get into the end zone. Sometimes... Yeah. They get six yards. Sometimes they get zero yards. Sometimes they fumble. Sometimes they're knocked out of the, the game in preseason for the whole season. Look at Edelman for the, mm. for the New England Patriots two years ago. That guy blew his knee out, came mm. back, and won the MVP in the same year. And I mean, it was so obvious. I'm watching the, the Super Bowl. I'm going... That guy deserves the MVP. Not Brady, not Gronk. They gave mm -hmm. it to him, and he deserved it. And mm -hmm. he was part of a team, and he just pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, and they couldn't stop him. And mm -hmm. he wanted it so bad. So that's that's me. I'm that running back that just keep pounding it in, and I'm driven like Edelman is that I want to be the best that I can be and I'll never be as great as I want to be. And it's like, there's a carrot in front of me and I'm going after it. And I enjoy the process to okay. the point where I enjoy the process. And the, 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 what, what happened, there was, you know, when you're a child, you know, when, and, and this is in the book, yeah, devast, you know, devastated, overwhelmed, fearful, embarrassed, uh, felt like a loser when I when I when I made mistakes or failed. Well, now as an adult, I say the new Kenny. That's the old Kenny. That's the mm -hmm. little Kenny. The big Kenny goes. There are no mistakes. There are no failures. There are no fuck ups. Those same situations, I call them gifts. I call mm -hmm. them opportunities. I call them lessons. So as an adult. If, say I'm doing a, a very, very important performance, and mm -hmm. be, because I'm human, and I'll never be as great as I want to be, uh, things can go wrong. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's somebody messes up, and I have to react, and I make the wrong reaction. We're human. It's like a boxer. You're doing everything right. The guy does something that is like, what? And next thing you know, boom, you're hitting the head because you didn't. Yeah. You did you ha you reacted wrong. So anyway, the point is is you stay in the game and you win the fight. And so as an adult, I still remember I still can get triggered of those old feelings like, oh fuck. And fuck <laughs> up. The new adult goes, easy now, easy, easy. Forget about it. Move forward. How can I be better from this? Well, first of all, in the moment, you you gotta push it aside. It's a technique I learned. You just push it aside. Forget about it. So at that moment, you're battling between the child who's going, oh, no, everyone's going to make fun of me. Everybody knows I made that mistake. Oh, my God. And you're battling the new, the adult Kenny, which is going, 
put it aside, Kenny, put it aside, or you're going to make another mistake and mm. another and another. Yeah. I said, and I believe, I believe that those are the moments where you solve problems in the middle of battle, in the middle of action, in the middle of performance. You have the ability to push forward, solve problems, keep moving, boots on the ground, one step at a time, and you get a touchdown. You score. Do you think the running back, when he's running and the guy comes flying across the field and puts his helmet in his rib cage and he goes, hey, man, that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> he can't say that. He's like, get the get out of the way. Right. Keeps going. And then another guy hits him in the head. Another guy hits him in the ankle. No, that's part of the game. So what I'm talking about is there are – natural feelings of failure and overwhelmness and embarrassment that you saw in the book. But, and I, I think I got pushed through because I was, I wanted to do better and, and I wanted to overcome my mistakes and prove to myself and everybody, no, I got this. And also it was my purpose in life. I wanted this so bad. That's why it's so important to do what you love because you will be unstoppable if you really love what you're doing. And that gives you the ability to persevere through all those negative experiences. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and actually, I was just going to say, you know, because it, it's uh, the example you were just giving. Uh, I found, uh, as I was doing research, found this quote where you said, you know, the thing I was able to recognize was, sure, there are people who are more talented than me and who can play faster but they haven't put in the time or had that experience, they won't know how to solve a problem, um, which is what you were talking about. But I never thought of making music in those con in that context. And so I'm curious how much of making music is problem solving. Well, it's not the making the music, it's the performance. Kennedy Center honors, right? There's the president of the United States. We're honoring Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin's up there. Then there's Tom Hanks up there, and then there's uh, whoever else, you know, they're honoring, all right? right. The, the room is filled with dignitaries, celebrities, politicians, the cream of the crop. This is the ultimate, this is the Super Bowl. You've only had a couple of days to practice. We're honoring, let's say when I honored, uh, let's say The Who, because I played yeah. with Dave, Dave Grohl. I played with Chris Cornell from Audio Slave, uh, Soundgarden. I played with uh, uh, Rob Thomas and on and on and on. And then the seven artists that come on and off the stage right in a row. And then that same night, I was in the band, the same band that honored George Jones, which mm -hmm. is a completely different style of music. Completely. Oh, yeah. Just not to get off, but to, I actually told Dave Grohl about this, and he was blown away. He was watching me in rehearsal. I said, Dave, watch this. When I played the Keith Moon style for the, honoring the Who, I'm on top of the beat. I'm pounding the bass drum in the head. I'm, I'm, I'm beating everything I can. It's almost like solo drums. It's very on top. It's very loud. It's very present. But with the George Jones country style, the bass drum beater comes off the head. You don't hit as loud. You're just trying to accentuate some sort of uh, a, a, a accent so that you can hear the bass guitar tones. The hi-hat, very, very soft. You can Keeping time for everybody, like a click track, up the rim, like I did with Keith Moon style. I, 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 I hit the center of the drum. You're a timekeeper. You're a field player, but you're not loud. You're in the background. Total mm -hmm. different style. Dave Grohl had never thought about it because he was like, because all Dave has to do is be brilliant Dave Grohl. Yeah. And my point is those two styles I had to play. Now, where I'm a problem solver, since we were reading music, They've making edits all the time up until up to the performance, right up until you're about to go on stage. You've only had a Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday to rehearse, arrange, rearrange, camera blocks, everything, and your performance is on Sunday also. Um, you're playing, and a, lot, and a lot of the artists only show up on Sunday, day of the show, being mm -hmm. filmed, 16 camera shoot, and it's going to be on TV all over the world at some yeah. point during that show during that performance i am fully aware that something will go wrong hmm. i don't know where i don't know when but it's always one 
weird thing that goes wrong every time. Either the artist who just rehearsed on that day forgets, oh, we're holding that note for six beats, not four beats. Mm -hmm. It's up to me as the drummer to direct that entire band in a very confident way that this is where we are. So here's an example. We're honoring Neil Diamond. Yeah. And there's an artist, a very, very famous artist. We're supposed to hold the note for six beats. When we got to that note, he didn't he didn't go, ah, and I bring the band in. He didn't do anything. He went, ah, silence. <laughs> I got thrown off and I and I and afterwards I went, shame on you for getting thrown off. You should have been counting regardless. Hmm. I turn around and looked at the MD and he's going like this, like as if the singer was holding it. Ah, I'm looking at him. <laughs> And then I went, boom, and the band comes in. Okay, mm -hmm. that's considered a mistake. At the end of the full performance, which is like a three and a half hour thing, yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not in every section. There's like five different art, uh, 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 you know, artists. Right, right. They music. they honor multiple people from different yeah. uh, uh, so, uh, artistic backgrounds. But the but the Neil Young thing was the last of the five. So we're told to stay on stage. I know this is how it works. Please don't leave. The producer is up there reviewing everything, the camera shots, the sound, everything. He's going to make an executive decision whether we have to redo that segment. Mm. Uh, and while that was happening, the MD that says, blah, 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 I can't hear, he's mumbling something about Kenny. And I'm mm. thinking, yeah. I should have been counting. And then the trumpet player comes up to me and goes, dude, thank you so much for bringing us in. I'm like, wow. He says it was perfect. <laughs> then I hear the, the MD mumble, and then he gets the word from up top, we're good. MD stands up and goes, everybody, thank Kenny Aronoff for saving the day. Wow. I mean, because I didn't count one, two, three, right. four, five, boom. Apparently, I came in at the right place because I had rehearsed it so much. But my point is, I solved the problem because in the moment of fear and like holy shit, <laughs> I brought the band. I was I was professional enough to to take leadership charge and bring the band in. That mm. is solving a problem in the middle of battle which is an absolutely terrifying moment. Because in yeah. a, in a, in my feeling is, if you mess up a situation like that, Kennedy Center honors and stuff, that MD will not hire you again. Hmm. It's like kind of like, in my mind, you make one big mistake, you're done. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and on the contrary, when you solve a problem, they they will hire you back because they know they can count on you. Not, this is, aside from your talent and your ability. Yeah. This, 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 which brings up a thing. I get hired for as much as my experience and my uh, be, me having so much under my belt now, I get hired because I have great, I know how to walk into a room and connect with somebody, communicate with them so that we can collaborate. Yeah. But so I get hired as much for that skill as I do for my talent, I think. In that book, remember Don was the producer, said, I hire Kenny because he saves my sessions. Kenny motivates the room. It was the Iggy Pop session where everybody yeah. was down, and I came busting in and motivated everybody and got everybody pumped. I didn't know they were down. I was just being me. I was mm. just happy to be there. I'm like, come on, let's go, man. Yeah. I didn't know until later that day we're in a, that the session was almost going to be canceled. Mm. But I go out there and I'm kicking ass because I'm just loving doing what I'm doing. And they had to overdub all their parts for the first 90 seconds to catch up to me. And <laughs> so, so, I mean, think about this. This is the schedule I had during that period. I'll mm. just explain. Monday, I'm recording with Bonnie Raitt and B.B. King for a movie Air America. It was a Dr. John song. Live it, uh, must have been the right place, must have been the wrong time. Tuesday yeah. and Wednesday, that's at Ocean Way Studios, LA. 
Tuesday, Wednesday, same studio, Elton John, box set. Might have even been the same room. Uh, box set for two days. Same studio, different room, Bob Seger for uh, Thursday through Sunday. Then I'd fly wow. from L.A. to Athens, Georgia, spend a week doing the Indigo Girls. Then I'd fly back to L.A. Next day, Willie Nelson. Next day, uh, Bob Seger for four more days to finish the record. Next two weeks at Henson or A&M Studios, Studio D, Bon Jovi, Blaze of Glory. Now, every artist is a different world, a different corporation, a different, a different boss. I have right. to come in there and connect with a B.B. King, a Bon Raitt, a Bon Jovi, a Willie Nelson, a Bob Seger, my heroes. I have to come in. I have to be able to get along with them. I have to be able to connect. They have to think like, I'm glad Kenny's here. And by the way, they already checked me out. There's no question. And the producer is the one that hires me to make him look good. And mm -hmm. so I, my job is to serve these people. I have to connect, communicate, collaborate, but I'm serving the team. My job is to get the song on the radio to be number one. That's it. It's not about me. It's about we. It's about, mm -hmm. uh, it's like, and, and so my skills in these situations, like the Kennedy Center Honors and uh, all these other TV things, I'm the most viewed guy on Access TV, apparently, because I do so <laughs> many of these shows. But the thing is, is that I'm hired because I'm a great team player and they need somebody that has experience, that's a problem solver, that is trying to make the, the, the team win the Super Bowl. It's not about me. It's about all of us. That is beyond your ability to play the drums. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a big component. I mean, that's – why do you think the Patriots are always in the Super Bowl or in the playoffs? Bill Belichick is all about getting the right team, the right guys to get along. It's not just about talented players. It's mm. about this ability to be – to work under him and be a team player, you know? Yeah. But I mean, you know, in the same respect, I mean, this also uh, speaks to you do a lot of talking uh, uh, for corporations and things like that. Um, and what you're saying definitely applies. But to me, the, what it applies to even more is that more and more work is shifting for you know, especially non-musicians, to what's called the gig economy. And you could argue, you know, you're kind of the reigning king of the gig economy, being uh, A, reliable, in demand, and adaptable. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for musicians or non-musicians on how best to succeed in a gig economy. Well, I've always looked at it as the gig economy. If I mean, I mean... The way you're explaining gig economy is, well, why don't you explain exactly how, what you mean exactly about gig economy? I usually take it to mean, and I usually read about it meaning, you know, uh, in the old days you would, you know, uh, uh, set up camp at a large corporation and, you know, you'd maybe rise through the ranks, but you would be there for your entire career. And in the oh, end, yeah. you'd get the retirement package and the gold watch. Yeah. Now, most people, uh, you know, are, and, and this is even if they're well-meaning and, and, and gung-ho for the company, end up having to change jobs, you know, uh, every couple of years, year after year, and uh, bounce from one place yeah. to the next. And so it is it's much more fluid. It's much more changeable. Uh, and so that's what that's what I think of when I think of the gig economy. Yeah, totally. You know, it's like my dad worked for the same corporation his whole life and did exactly what you said. Retired. Uh, my mom's still alive, 94, two days ago, and she's living in the house we grew up in. All paid off. There's enough money in the pension to cover her needs until she, she moves on. And, um, yeah, that's a whole different ballgame. And, you know, there I thought – I thought when I got in the Mellencamp band, which I was there for 17 years, I was going to be there forever, kind of. You know, I just thought, I, I mean, no. I think <laughs> deep down I knew, I think deep down I knew I wasn't going to be, but I could have made mm -hmm. that work. That's my point. The, the, there, were diff, there were reasons why I moved on, but that was an example of how, because there was a guy who's still there. 
a guitar player, has been there over 40 years now. So in a way, he made that work. Uh, you know, in music, it's really tricky. I mean, oh my God. Uh, you go ahead, watch the uh, documentary on Chicago and seeing people moving in and out. There's some core yeah. guys that have stayed there 50 years. But so I think I was always playing in that gig economy uh, that b business model from day one because nobody was offering me any sense of security that mm -hmm. made me feel like I can stay here forever and I'll be okay. Never. I remember thinking at one point, here's what happened. Mellencamp band. This is what did it. All right, we get in the band. We never, you know, I never made big money with that band. It was a band. John, it was John's band. He wrote the songs. We arranged them with him. I mean, I came up with that iconic drum beat in Jack and Diane. Song was off the record. It's his biggest number hit, number one hit single ever. But the bottom line, John wrote all the lyrics, wrote the songs. It was, it's his gig. It's his band. It's his contract. Yeah. He pays us. All right. The persona was we were a band. That's all right. I was fine with. It. I was happy to be on. I was happy flying in private jets and staying at the Ritz Carlton's in Four Seasons and selling out arenas all over the world. Or yeah. USA at least so but a, a very heavy thing happened 1988 last show of the Lonesome Jubilee tour we are one of America's biggest bands all right sold out we're playing it in Milwaukee Summerfest mm -hmm. a big maybe there was 25,000 people there and at the end of the show this this wasn't I mean I was like backstage you know probably drinking champagne probably had a couple of chicks around me you know it was just like yeah it was like i mean that as as you know friends we had backstage party at the end of the last show right, john right. comes up john comes up to me and goes he throws a bonus check at me that's when we used to get bonus checks and he mm. said he said don't spend it all at once motherfucker i'm quitting the music business for three years fuck this i'm done <laughs> now I didn't do this, but let's just, uh, basically, in my heart, I dropped the bottle of champagne, pushed the girls <laughs> away, and went, what? Yeah. Because, be, because I, I, I never saw it coming. I, yeah. are you, I never, I thought, we, we don't, because we would go, for the people who don't know, to get Mellencamp to go from almost losing his record deal again, we would spend two years in a cycle of two years. Writing songs, arranging songs, recording songs, uh, artwork for the album, interviews, marketing, and then a year of touring, rehearsing, and then a year of touring, take a month off and start again. That's like a two-year cycle. We didn't stop for eight years, nonstop, mm -hmm. never stop. And he suddenly says, I'm quitting? Now, it, it, I, and I had just gotten divorced, so I had a a mortgage, child support, car payment, utilities, and alimony. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, just every, uh, no, I did a payout. There wasn't alimony in Indiana, you do a payout. So there was a oh, payout, okay. it's just child support. But the point is, I wasn't a rich man, but I was able to take care of all that. But I looked at my bank statement and went, bank account, went, you got given you it. You got five months of money saved. What the fuck are you going to do? Now that yeah. essentially, remember how I said how there are no mistakes and there are no failures? The gift, yeah. the takeaway from this was this launched my session career. Because yeah. there's a saying, like sometimes, it's not a saying, but what I basically did is I heard what he said and I believed him. Trust me, he was convincing. In my book, I explained he didn't mean that. Because uh, there was no way, realistically, if I thought about it, there's no way he's going to take three years off. I mean, he made a movie, started painting, and we made actually a record, Big Daddy, quickly after. But the point is, he scared the crap out of me because I realized the company just released me. That security mm -hmm. was gone. So I looked, I heard what he said on a Saturday night. And on Sunday, I heard it in a different way. Mm. That's my point. I saw something like this, and then I looked at it like this. 
And yeah. that's a great lesson because you sometimes you need to do that. Mm -hmm. And here's what happened. I heard him say, I'm taking three years off. And the next day I went, you know what? I've worked with one amazing artist for eight years. Now I'm going to go work with all the other ones. <laughs> That's, so I went to L.A. I mm -hmm. already was booked on some sessions, but then I went after it hard. And the next thing you know, I get my big break uh, from Don was calling me up to do Iggy Pop. Iggy, and while we're doing the Iggy Pop record, Brick by Brick, it's a brilliant record. And Don has to go to the Grammys. Now, Don wasn't a big producer yet. He just kind of yeah. got started. Don goes to the Grammys, and he wins two or three Grammys. To, uh, Nick of Time by Bonnie Raitt, which relaunched her career. Her career yeah. was over. And he had produced an, uh, a Love Shack by B-52s, which was a huge hit that year. So yeah. there's our producer on stage getting these Grammys. Well, the next thing you know, I'm doing Bob Dylan, Bob Seger, uh, uh, you know, Elton John, on and on and on. And I, I, he's hiring me for everything. Suddenly it's like, wow, Kenny Aronoff is this, you know, had this big drum sound, Mellencamp, he had that big drum sound in the 80s that was, they made the drums real loud, they made them loud in the mix. It yeah. really featured me, you know, simple playing, but I was, it was very strong and powerful. And so everyone said, wow, this guy, Kenny Arnoff, and, you know, the Jack and Diane drum fill, one of the most air drum drum fills <laughs> in, in the history of rock. So, right. um, and so everybody knew who I was, but they didn't know I was a session guy. Just because you're a band guy doesn't mean you're a session guy. So then I started getting a reputation. Wow, this guy can play anything. And then I went after Nashville. And mm -hmm. I literally faxed producers because I lived in Indiana, so it was only four and a half hours away. Next thing you know, I've got a business in Nashville. I've got a business in L.A., New York, and wherever anybody. I had drum sets in New York, Nashville, L.A., and obviously Indiana. And there actually was a lot of records being made in Indiana. And, hmm. yeah, we had a very big music scene there. The point is, because that John had said that, and all of a sudden, me being a company man, when I realized the company can fire me, holy shit, and I have no control, I went, that will never fucking happen again. And that's when I started to take control of my career. And mm -hmm. eventually, that, that you know, I, I literally took myself off retainer. We had a small, itsy bitsy teeny retainer that could mm -hmm. barely cover, it couldn't even cover all my expenses. No. I took myself off retainer so that when the call came in, I was a free agent. Mm. And so that eventually John wanted uh, the company man when he got, I mean, I get it. He was the boss, man. It's his thing. He needed a guy that was there. Yes, sir. No matter what. And even mm -hmm. John said to me, John even said to me, but by then I was like, I was like, nah. <laughs> I mean, John said to me, look, it, you can do any session you want, because he didn't really want me to leave. I mean, now mm -hmm. that I look back in hindsight, because we had a, sand, a, a, a sound. Yeah. John, and, John and I were like uh, uh, Bill Belichick and, and, uh, and, and Tom Brady. We, were, we both were intense. We both were, we pushed each other. It was a great combination. John was basically saying, you know, listen, you can do any session you want, but when I call, you got to come. And I said, John. Look, that's 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 awesome. But a lot of these sessions, they build it around the rhythm section. So if Don was says like, I remember when we, he said that to me. I was I was playing with Little Feet. I was, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the drummer with Little Feet was um, he was playing with Eric Clapton. So they called me up to do this record where we were us uh, the the band behind this you know rock god from uh, goddess from Denmark. Sana Solomonson, and they needed somebody, so they hired me. So uh, they 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 were very selective of who they picked. It was me, and that's what they built the session around me with them. So I was trying to explain that to John, and John didn't like that. So eventually we parted ways. But my point was that I realized in this business, it's rare, rare that you're going to stay with that corporation forever. So yeah, it is a gig thing now. It is a gig mm. thing. And, and and then it happened again when the budgets went to shit 
in the music business. I'm in yeah. LA and I get a call from a project coordinator and she says, Hey Kenny, it's it's Sherry, man. I got the session uh next uh blah 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 blah. Uh uh can you do it? I said, Yes. Yeah. Says, Are you gonna be in town? I went, Well, no, but I mean why? What's the problem? Because they usually fly you. They fly me in. I right, fly right. in first class, get a rental car, stay at the greatest hotels in LA per diem. Get double scale, sometimes triple scale. I mean, it was money. we flying all the way. <laughs> so I said, "Well, are the budgets changing?" Silence. She <laughs> goes, "Well, yeah." Thirty days later, I had an apartment in L.A., which meant oh. now I had suddenly now I had thirty three thousand dollars worth of expenses per month that I never had before. Mm -hmm. I suddenly now have a new. But my point was, I said, "This is not a good sign." If I'm going to stay relevant, I have to adapt and adjust to the system. Mm. And and the system was changing. So I got an apartment, then eventually moved out here, got a semi, picked up all my drums and everything out of that. Indiana, went down to Nashville, picked up all 62 drums and stuff there, had the, in, the drums from New York City shipped. Everything's in L.A. now. And then the next move is I got my own studio where people mm. send me files and I record their drums from all over the world. Or if they're in LA, they come in my studio. I have a drum room, I have a control room, and I hire an engineer uh, 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 that does all my recording, and it's a professional, full-blown setup. Yeah. I, and I, and I, in in both situations, or three situations, getting the apartment, and actually getting two apartments so I could spread out, and then eventually getting buying a house, selling the house in Indiana. That's number two, and finally then investing in a lot of uh, equipment to get a studio. Those are three moves that made me stay relevant and still be in the game. Because if you're not on the field, you can't score goals. And if you're on the bench too long, you're off the team. So mm -hmm. I adapted to be relevant in this business. So that is being the gig guy. Sessions, adapting, tours, um, uh, you know, I, well, there used to be drum clinic tours. There's none of that anymore. It's it's a gig yeah. situation. You're always, and now with the COVID-19, you know, uh, there's a whole, you know, obviously for two months, maybe three months, hopefully not more than that. Uh, those those uh, live tours I'm on have been postponed. You know, Joe Satriani, right. John, John Fogarty, whoever else hires me, they're being postponed right now. So... Uh, this 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 adaptability, or, or that I'm going through, which is fine. I mean, I got plenty of work. I've got I got so much going on. I've got some sessions. I'm I I, I stay mentally, physically, emotionally healthy, and mm -hmm. then I I go to my studio where nobody is. It's just me, car, studio, car, home. Not seeing anybody. I'm quarantined. If you look at my posts on. Uh, I'm oh, yeah, I've been watching. Yeah, right. <laughs> the peanut butter Kenny's one. quarantine diary, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You that know, one where you planked for the entire time, yeah. The plank, the five-minute plank. I mean, right. anyway, so uh, it's, uh, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, which you asked a while ago, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I, think I've, I think I've been in gig mode uh, uh, for quite a while, you know. Hmm. I'm not in the Rolling Stones. You know where? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a member. I'm not in U2 where they, you know, it's four members of a band. I'm a hired gun. Right. Yeah, and and hence the movie you made the appearance in. Um, mm -hmm. but, and what interests me though, I mean, because there's so many guys that didn't adapt like you did. What do you credit the difference being? Uh, well, some of it's fear, <laughs> some of it's concern, uh, some of it is, is this, I, t I, I my son, Nick, uh, I, I, I said, I'm going to give you two bits of advice when, you know, he became a man, he's 35 now, I said, this is it, keep in mind, in your head, that you're, you're on your own in life, it's all up to you. You're on your own. When you have that attitude, 
you're not looking for somebody to help you. You realize it's up to you to help you. I believe that if anybody who's capable or everybody should do the best that they can do to take care of themselves. If that means staying healthy, that means uh, whatever it takes to take care of yourself, the world would be unbelievable because Mm -hmm. then everybody was self-sufficient. So that's not always the case, obviously. But the point is, I said, Nick, don't count on anything but yourself and everything else is gravy. You know what I mean? Obviously, Mm -hmm. if you're in a relationship, you want to count on your partner to, you know, to to be a team. But if you make that agreement, but basically, if you have that attitude, I, it's up to me to get things done. It's up to me to get results. It's up to me. Man, that puts you always, always looking towards yourself for answers and not always looking, oh, help me. The other bit of advice I give him is stay healthy. Stay healthy because you're on your own. <laughs> Again, <laughs> you're on your own. Mm. Because obviously, I'm what I'm doing is I'm trying to tell Nick and I tell myself, when you can depend on yourself as much as possible, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Way ahead of the game. So any benefits or any help you do get is is almost extra but mm-hmm. if you're just looking for help and you're not ge- taking care of yourself then the guy like me who's o- trying to be self-sufficient and 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 take care of myself i'm going to be ahead of you i'm going to be moving forward mm. as soon as the covid 19 thing started happening i was already making plans i was executing things by writing them down what is my life going to be this is way before I mean, a month ago, I was giving speeches all over Indiana. I was doing sessions. I was doing live gigs with Fogarty. And I knew that this was going to probably shut down. And I already had a plan of action. I was already looking at how I was going to survive in every aspect. And I'm okay. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And because I am, I'm looking, I have the attitude of looking after myself taking care of myself, you know. Not not selfishly, but... No, No, help. It's not uh, selfish. It's it's being helpful for the society. Yeah, because if I take care of me, if I can take care of Mm. me, then other people don't have to take care of me. They can take care of them and their families. Mm -hmm. I know there's a... I know we could get in... uh, People could get into a discussion... Uh, with me about this, and there's all kinds of gray areas and stuff. But right. just the, the, the this is just to be. I'm stating it. It's just a concept in general. You know what I mean? If I if I got off this interview and fell down the stairs and broke my knee, uh, I might need some help. And in that case, yeah. yes. You know what I mean? But if I have a, my knee in a cast, I promise you, I'll be that guy that will do as much as I can to to be able to be self-sufficient. I'm the mm-hmm. guy, when they say do therapy and, and recovery stuff, uh, rehab, I'm the guy who's going to put in not two hours, I'm going to put in six hours so I can be back on, uh, in, in, you know, on the field. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's an attitude of being able, willing and wanting to take care of yourself. And so people... Some people, and I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just talking about me. But yeah. um, I think this is what served me well and made it possible for me to make it to adapt, and you know, adapt. I'm not the best at everything I do, but I do the best that I can at what I do. You mm-hmm. know, and so, and with that attitude, I'm always trying my best. And yeah. I, I, I don't just sit back and give up. And then another thing that struck me with the autobiography was I didn't realize the amount of classical training that you had had, especially during your college years, you know, Timpathy and, and, you know, uh, working with Leonard Bernstein and, and all of this. And, you know, 
when you flash forward to, you know, Mellencamp or what you're doing now with Joe Satriani, I'm curious, what's what's the through line there? How did all of that classical training inform what you do in the rock world? Well, definitely, it gave me ridiculous discipline, and it taught me how to read and write. You know, like, I, I'm kind of known as the, this big chart writer. That's a Joe mm-hmm. Satriani song that's on the radio right now, you know, 1980. And the the point is, is that uh, uh, that's why I can go from Kennedy. Well, you can't do the Kennedy Center honors if you can't read. you got to be able to read and write like a mofo. And then, you know, when <laughs> when I, you know, I got, you know, I, I got a whole book of charts for the Joe Satriani tour. You know, I can't memorize that fast. And then I'm doing sessions and I write all this stuff out. And so it gave me that. It also gave me massive discipline, as I mentioned, because to get into Indiana University, Indiana University, which is the number one school of music and classical music, to get in is hard. To stay in it is even harder because the reason why they're number one and have been number one since I graduated, this is like 30 something years, is because they, they have the best students, the best teachers, and then it's massively disciplined. It's not a hand-holding, coddling uh, program there. It's now called the Jacob School of Music. As a matter of fact, I have a, the, the Aronoff Scholarship there that'll be there oh. for the, forever. Yeah, I, nice. I've, I've, I've embedded it into that university until the whole world c- falls apart. But yeah, kids get scholarships uh, under my name. But the point is, that school taught me massive discipline and I, I got my ass kicked. Now, let's back up. So in my family, when it was time to go to college, that was the American dream. I mean, my parents, my dad fought in World War II. He was a navigator in the big bombers that, that took out Hitler. The last uh, 13 or 15 missions over Berlin and all mm. over Germany. Luckily, his plane didn't get shot out of the sky. There were 10 men in those big bombers. And, um, and then he went to college. Uh, and became a businessman, uh, you know, working for a division of Kimberly Clark, which is paper. My mom went to college mm-hmm. at, uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, what's, it, what's the big, NYU, uh, became a school teacher. Uh, so it was just natural for them, the next generation, you put your kids through college, and then they have a family, and they take care of their kids, and then they, you know, everybody is taking care of themselves. You okay. know, yeah, everybody yeah. is is learning to be responsible and 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 that's your contribution to society Mm -hmm. and um that ties back to what i was talking about so when they asked me what do you want to major and i went well the only thing i i have a passion for is music but there was no school of rock back then there was no drum set teacher teaching me rock back then it was all new so Mm -hmm. this was the 60s so but the thing that got me into classical music was the Boston Symphony Orchestra had their summer festival at a place called Tangle, Tanglewood in Lenox, Mass, which was three miles from my house. Mm-hmm. And my parents would always take me there, and I wasn't really interested in classical music at all. I was into rock. But there was a teacher, a percussionist there, uh, Arthur Press, who was giving lessons to a couple of my buddies that were drummers in town. I noticed their technique was getting better. And I went, what do you, wow, would you learn that? I says, oh, I take lessons from Arthur Press. I went, well, I'm going to do that because I was competitive. So the first lesson I took, I got on a bus in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where I grew up. We went pretty almost all the way to Boston. And uh, I, I, I get off the bus and we walk to the, me, me and one of the other guys did it together. We walked to his house. And he, I just remember, he seemed real tall and I was real small. He goes, what's your name? I said, Kenny. Kenny what? I went, Kenny Aronoff. He says, what have you prepared for me today? I went, uh, I didn't know I was supposed to prepare anything. He says, D- you don't have a marimba piece you're working on? I went, what's marimba? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going, mm. <laughs> He says, you don't have a timpani piece? I said, I've never played timpani in my life. Said, what do you? What are you doing here? I said, well, I play drum set. I'm like totally freaking out. Yeah. Go downstairs, just play some drums. He puts on Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Spinning Wheels, which I've been playing along to. I'm a self-taught drummer at this point. Okay. And I'm playing, and he's, 
30 seconds, he rips me off the drum set and goes, he points over there, practice pad. We start right from the beginning. Anyway, for sophomore, let's see, I'm 16 now. It's the sophomore year, uh, the end of my sophomore year, all the way through my senior year, summer and all four, all year long, I would study with him once a month during the winter year in the summer, once a week. And I got a set of vibes, secondhand set of vibes, and I learned how to play timpani, mallets, and read. But I was way behind kids that were in the, you know, the high school marching band and the concert band. I had nothing to do with that. Because mm -hmm. I was going like, what do I want to play with a squeaky squeaky clarinet and out of tune strings when I'm playing rock and roll in bars at age 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is not cool. Plus I was a three letterman jock. I mean, my sophomore mm -hmm. year, was, I was on three varsity sports, soccer, okay. ski team and lacrosse. As a matter of fact, I was one of the best scoring lacrosse players, attack guys in Western mass in high school. And when I, my first year in college was UMass and they were number nine in the country. Mm. And I, I did one practice with them and got my ass slaughtered. They beat <laughs> the, I had that, that coach, it's a long story, but that coach wanted to show me what it was like to play for him. And uh -huh. I got, I'd never been hit so hard in my life. Literally. <laughs> and, and I suddenly went, well, how, how do you make a living playing lacrosse? You don't. <laughs> so I, I gave it up. So anyway, so the day I graduated high school, and this was all fear-based, I started mm -hmm. practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week, because I knew I was behind. Uh, uh, by the way, I, what it was, I got into the University of Massachusetts yeah. uh, School of Music, which was more of an educational program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't a high-performance school. The top three schools in the country are Indiana University, Juilliard in New York, and Eastman in Rochester. So okay. my audition, this says something about me. My audition, I have a, a, a marimba piece that I, mm -hmm. I never played marimba. I learned it on vibes, very simple piece, a snare drum piece and a timpani piece. <clears throat> the Professor Tanner was his name. He says, let me hear your, mal your mallet piece. This is why I learned it on vibes. He says, Play it on marimba. The bars are different size, you know, so I'm, uh. I'm learning, trying to play this piece, and I kind of muddle through it. Then he does what they do in auditions. He puts up music to sight read, music oh. you've never seen. Mm -hmm. He starts to conduct the tempo, and I'm completely fucking it up. I'm a <laughs> horrible sight reader. And he goes, okay. oh. He goes, yeah, okay. He goes to grab it, and I went, no. <laughs> I said, I can do it again. Because I was embarrassed. I knew mm -hmm. I'd blown it. So I do it again. He says, oh, no, that's okay. I'm like, no, I'm going to mm -hmm. do it again. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm practicing this piece in front of him. All right. <laughs> him. I, yeah, I was so embarrassed. I, I just couldn't stand the failure. And so mm -hmm. I kept doing it. Finally, he went, my, okay. Years later, he told me that's why he accepted me. Oh. It, was be, it was because. I wasn't, I, I wasn't willing to give up. And he thought, oh, I'm going to love teaching this guy. He's going to be a hardworking student. I'm going to enjoy developing this kid's talent. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I practicing all summer long, knowing I'm way behind. I get there, I'm way behind. Oh, I was I, working with conductors, uh, you know, oh my God, I'm like, I'm freaking out. I remember just in tears sometimes in my dorm going, what the fuck? Well, Eastman School of Music is five hours up the road. And I thought, I can't stay here. Even though I'm not the best, this is just, they don't have that attitude that I have. So I go up, I had my dad drive me up to Eastman and I audition. And the teacher there said, listen, come on up, but we only have 14 percussions. That's all we have. And right now we have a full house. If you get in, unless somebody leaves, you know, you're not going to be able to come. The reason why they only have 14 is they want to make sure the people that are going there, they're, they're being, they have a place to, they have ensembles to play in. They don't mm -hmm. want these kids just standing around. So okay. 
I do I audition and I get in. But because I was a transfer student, they had no room for transfer students. So I can't go. I'm when I'm in I'm at UMass and there's this you know, we're in some I think it was the spring, I this kind of hot cellist a junior chick says she's going to Aspen School of Music for the summer. I went, What's Aspen? She says, mm. Oh, it's a very a very elite orchestra run by Juilliard. Run by Juilliard. I'm like, wow. If I go there, I can hang out with this hot chick and maybe I'll transfer to Juilliard, number mm-hmm. two school in the country. So I audition on tape, you know, a, a timpani piece, a, a marimba piece, a multiple percussion piece, and a snare piece. Send the, the tape off. I never hear from anybody. Last day of school, I went, okay, I'll study with Arthur Press for the summer. I got this cool Almond Brother band. And uh, that's right. That'll be my summer. And I'll come back. I mean, it's great. Last day of school, I got my dad's car p- packed up. I'm driving away. I went, oh, shit, I forgot my mail. I go back, open up the mailbox. And I went, oh, I got a check. I went, who owes me money? I open up. <laughs> I'm accepted to Aspen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not only am I accepted, I got a $500 scholarship, which was like 5000 to me back then. <laughs> and then in 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 retrospect, I'm thinking they accepted me, and I had to go in two weeks. I think I was an alternate. Hmm. Uh, you, okay. know, you know, because, you know, because you know you can't not much time to plan. Yeah. So yeah. I go, I go there. My parent, my mom bummed out because I have a twin brother, and we went off to college, and now the the boys are back. This is great. When we left the house, you know, my sister was there with my mom and dad. It was kind of everything got very quiet. So now I'm telling my parents I'm going to Aspen. And mom, my mom was bummed. So I go to Aspen. I am the worst percussionist there. These guys, <laughs> oh my God, these guys were like, were at Juilliard. They were at all the best schools in the country. They'd been playing timpani and mallets when they were in their diapers. I mm. didn't even know what these instruments were. They were amazing. And I got my ass crushed by the conductors mm. there. Yelling, screaming at me mortified, embarrassed, life-changing moment. The teacher who taught at Aspen ran the department at Indiana University School of Music, the percussion department, and that is the number one school in the country. I went, I want to go to Indiana University. I want to audition. I want to study with you. Now, that Mm -hmm. guy, George Gaber, this guy had worked with Stravinsky, Mm -hmm. Bella Bartok, Toscanini, the conductor, that ruled with a gun. This guy was like hardcore Marine drill sergeant, but very intelligent, very worldly, very wise man. I wanted to be around this guru. Mm. He said, he looked at me and went, why don't you come back in January and audition? I went, I want to audition (laughs) here. He went, come back in January. I went, I want to audition here. (laughs) And he kind of went, wow. <laughs> Same thing as t- Peter Tanner. This guy's damn serious. He says, okay, to get into Indiana University, you have to audition for four departments. So it'd be like woodwinds, brass, piano, uh, percussion, vocals, whatever. And damn it, there were four different teachers from Indiana University from four different departments at Aspen. I oh. audition I, and I get in. So I go right from there. Hey, mom, how's it going? <laughs> Came up to Indiana University. <laughs> I'm not coming home. <laughs> <laughs> so I, went, I, I drove to IU, one of the most beautiful campuses in the country, and I, I had to take all these exams. I go home, I get my shit. My mom drives me out, and now I'm in the number one school of music. And I worked my way from the bottom to the top. I uh, was not the best. My uh, I, I made friends with a senior, and we would practice till one to two in the morning, and mm. then we'd go even on the weekends, and then we then we'd go out and do some drinking and partying. But it was business first. And by the time I was a senior, I'd want to con- I I w- w- to graduate Indiana Indiana University. You have to do a junior and a senior recital, and on the senior recital, I pick epic timpani part. 
uh, 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 Bella Bartok wrote this amazing part for two pianos, timpani, and percussion. It's one of the most musical pieces, but literally on stage, it's chamber music. The two pianos are sideways facing each other mm. with, uh, toward the audience, and then in back of them or behind them, if you're from the audience perspective, uh, the percussionist and timpanist are looking at the audience, and the musical parts and the rhythmic parts go between all four instruments. So like, a, for example, one movement, the piano player may go in, the xylophone, very, very brilliantly written, very mm -hmm. difficult. So that was my timpani piece. The mallet piece, the marimba piece I chose, which was a, a very famous concerto written by Camille Sanson called the introduction to Ron, uh, to introduction and Rondo Capricioso. It's the okay. most beautiful piece. It's a virtuosic piece that Itzhak Perlman, I saw him perform it at Indiana University uh, as his encore. But it's oh. so beautiful. It's so technical, but so beautiful. I went, that's going to be my marimba piece for my senior recital. I practice that thing two hours a day, 365 days a year, for wow. one year. So that was my senior recital piece. There were two other pieces. After, if you give a, a recital, when you, before the, the percussion department, there's four teachers, before you can even perform the recital for the students, for the university, you have to perform it for those four guys. And if they think you're ready, then you can perform. If they don't, mm -hmm. that's why the Indiana University is badass. And a mm -hmm. lot of people, they say, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that piece done, you don't graduate. That concert. Yeah. Okay. So they, not only did they say you're ready, they nominated for thing, me for this thing called the performer certificate, which means they think not only did you pick great pieces that you prepared, but you have uh, the ability to perform like an artist. Mm -hmm. So when I gave the recital in this big hall, eight people, teachers from eight different departments have to come. Mm -hmm. Woodwinds, brass, piano, vocal, percussion, on, 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 on. At the end of my performance, they renominate me for the performance certificate. I come back at a designated time and perform in front of 16 faculty. That's it. Only faculty. No. And I got and I won the performance certificate unanimously. <laughs> and so I graduate this incredible university. I worked my way from the bottom from shit and became really good. And and every summer, every no, every uh spring for four years that I was at Indiana University, I auditioned to get into Tanglewood, which was this this, which was run by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, is a fellowship program. It's the best student orchestra in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, this is me being a go-getter, trying to be the best, do the best. And I auditioned. It was for Vic Firth, the timpanist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Uh, eventually created the biggest stick company in the world. Yeah. And I auditioned for him, and I, I strike out. I had a, not a great audition. I come back the next year. I got it now. I auditioned, rejected. I'm like, no. God damn. <laughs> I come back again. I, I strike out. And then I start taking lessons with him, you know, in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I go back I go back a fourth time and God, God damn it, I did. So there's <laughs> only seven percussions in the whole world. But at that orchestra was so elite. And as you read in my book, I mean, mm -hmm. I got to work with Leonard Bernstein, Sergio Ozawa, uh, yeah. Aaron Copeland, the conductor, composer. And as you remember, and I want the, the, the listener to, to hear this story, the first rehearsal, I mean, dude, this is serious business. There's no joking around in this orchestra. The first rehearsal, Sergio Ozawa, the conductor, a Japanese conductor, just my point of this story is that, well, I'll tell you the point afterwards, but Sergio walks in. He's dressed in white. His hair is immaculately, it's flowing, it's, it's, it's black, it's long. And he, his whole point was to rule and get control over us. 
Hmm. And he's very, very, very like stoic and says, he has the uh, first the first violinist tune the orchestra up. That's what you do. You have the first. He gets an A. Everybody tunes to him. So they mm -hmm. all be in tune. Then he goes, what pieces are we doing today? That son of a bitch had them all memorized. He had all the <laughs> scores memorized. He was just fucking with us. Wanted us to think that he, didn't, he didn't know. So his hands come up. I mean, this guy conducted like I'd never seen anything like it in my life it's just it's hard to describe it was mm -hmm. flowing flowing but just it was like he was an extension of the music in a way i'd never seen it was amazing he stops after about a minute or two and just completely crushes the whole orchestra every single you know like the the first violinist the second violinist the violas the cellists the the, the woodwinds he's going he's trying to demand control and he and there's a very famous tambourine part in the second piece, which is by Ravel. And Vic Firth warned me, he says, this guy crushed 150 percussionists for an audition for San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, which mm. he was the conductor for. And what it is, you're doing this beautiful music and all of a sudden it stops and he points to the violins and they go, then he points to me and I have to go on the tambourine. I had to make a decision. Do I do it with one hand or do I put the tambourine flat and play it with two hands? Because mm -hmm. if, it's too, if it's too fast, I'll never be able to do it. When you go, each one has to be slightly a little bit softer. Oh, okay. And he's he's listening for that. So I went, oh shit, I'm gonna. So I got a piece of foam, tilted the tambourine up, and the the trick is, if you're playing over two jingles, each one may be a little differently pitched, or each finger is a little different, so it, it won't mm -hmm. be better than that. There might be but uh, uh, you know, but uh, 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 uh. Anyway, mm -hmm. he said, Vic said, look him right in the eye, and smile when you do it. Maybe <laughs> he'll leave you alone. Sure enough time he's like looking at me to do it he's pointing with these fierce eyes and then he stops and he comes back i'm like oh shit <laughs> let, me hear you. let me hear your tambourine nah i don't like <laughs> well how about this one i have another one <laughs> no i don't like it's just oh how about this one <laughs> nah go back to the first one <laughs> so at the end of the rehearsal Everybody splits. I'm like just shaking in my boots. Mm. I'm I'm picking up all this percussion stuff in the back of the room. Everybody's gone. It's nighttime, dark, and all of a sudden I hear two people talking. And I peek up over the music stand. Oh my God! It's Leonard Bernstein, the great composer conductor, talking to Seji. And this is what Seji says: I don't understand. This orchestra is supposed to be the greatest orchestra in the country. They're not playing. They're not playing. They're not giving me what I want. And Lenny puts his hand on his shoulder and goes, they are the best orchestra in the country, says he. Show some love and show some compassion, and they will perform for you. Mm -hmm. And the point, my point in the book was one guy was ruling as a dictator, and the other yeah. guy was coming from a place of love and passion. And... Everybody wanted to play with Bernstein. So the first, and everybody in percussion wants to play timpani. Mm. So there's only seven of us. The first week, three people get to play timpani because there were three different pieces. And they, the second week, three people get to play. It was the last guy. Third week, mm. last guy, Bernstein is conducting. Sibelius Fifth Symphony, it's this big timpani thing. I'm now playing timpani with Leonard Bernstein. My mom was crying in the audience. She couldn't believe her. Her son is playing at Tanglewood with Leonard Bernstein. Oops. Anyway, the moral of this story is I get this incredible education. I graduate Indiana University. I get into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. Huge mm -hmm. honor. There aren't that many orchestras. I'm in the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. I get that call. And I look in the mirror and I go, fuck, I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't want to go. And here's what happened. I turned down certainty for complete uncertainty. 
I hmm. turned down certainty, a paycheck, a prestigious job for complete possibility, hmm. uncertainty, which is to be a rock and roll drummer. What happened at that moment was I was, I realized I don't want to go to Israel and play in an orchestra. See, because when I was playing, when I was in all, taking this education at IU and UMass and Aspen, and I was playing drum set on the side all the time. At night, mm. I was, I practiced, I was always playing in rock bands, jazz bands. I was playing bebop at night. I was playing mm. funk. I was playing country. I was doing anything I could to play drum set because that really, back to 10 years old, was my purpose, my passion. So mm. when I finally got the big call, I went, no. And I ended up moving back home. And now I'm like humbly, totally humbly, like, holy shit, I'm back home practicing eight hours a day, studying with a teacher in New York, Gary Chester, studying mm. in Boston with a guy who taught at Berkeley for 20 years, um, Alan Dawson. And finally, after a year, I moved back to Indiana where everybody said, you're never going to make it there. There's no music business there. You should go to New York or LA. But I go back there because the business model was we form a band. We're going to write songs. We had uh, one of the dads invested 30 grand in equipment for us. We had a mm -hmm. truck, we had lights, we had PA, and we're going to make this work. And we write songs, we get a record deal, and we go on tour, and we become famous. Well, after three years of that, it didn't happen. Yeah. The band was called Stream Winner. I'm going to move. To, I'm 27 now, and I don't have shit. <laughs> and I'm going to move. I'm going to move to New York City. I'm about mm. to move. I'm having lunch with this girl, Ruthie Allen, who's, um, a, a, you know, a songwriter. And she right. said, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? I said, what I'm doing. I said, what are you doing? Blah, blah. She says, hey, you know, this guy, <clears throat> you know, this guy, he's, he makes, he records songs. He's got albums and he's on this new TV show called MTV and he's on the radio. I went, yeah, you know, I wasn't a big fan. She says, well, he just fired his drummer last night. He just came off a tour opening up for, I don't know, it was Kiss or somebody. I went, also went, holy shit. <laughs> oh my God, dude, this is what I always wanted to do. Holy mm -hmm. shit. I go running out to the pay phone. I call the guitar player and I get the audition. Long story short, I, I write charts out. I memorize yeah. every song on their last record. I come in, I blow them, them away. Five weeks later, I'm in LA. I'm at the Sunset Marquee Hotel, Rockstar Hotel. And De Niro's there, and Meryl Streep's there. Everybody's there. I'm in the studio. I'm like telling everybody, I made it. I made it. I'm fucking doing it. I'm going to be on the radio. I'm in a band with Torn. And in two days, I get fired from the record. Mm -hmm. I so read. I'm completely <laughs> devastated. Yeah. And so, I uh, I mean, if any people probably know the story by now, but uh, what happened was the producer, you know, they didn't have Pro Tools. You had to. It was tape. You had to get full takes. They didn't yeah. like punching in the drums. You had to have the right drums. You had to know how to tune. You had to know how to play perfectly in time. You had to be able to play with click tracks. You had to learn how to play behind the beat, on top of the beat. You had to have all these skills that I didn't have enough experience doing. Basically, I had no experience making records to get on the radio to be number one. That was it. And mm -hmm. the producer knew it. And he had to get the record done in eight weeks. And so th there was a time factor. So as I'm being told, you're not on the record and you go home, another life-changing moment. I said to the boss, my boss, who was telling me, I said, no, I ain't going anywhere. I'm mm -hmm. not going home. Because he was trying to take away my, my purpose in life. I was like, no, no way. Yeah. You, taking this? you can't take this. By the way, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just fighting. I was like, got in the mode. You know that fight or flight? Well, mm -hmm. there was no flight. I was like, dude, I was like, I'm not going <laughs> home. I was I was so embarrassed and so mortified. There was no way I was going to go home. I'd have to hide. I'd rather go to Mars. So I suddenly, this just popped out of my mouth. He says, well, God damn it, am I still your drummer or what? He goes, yeah, but you're not, you're not playing on the record. And then I go, uh, I'm trying to fumble. Like, what do I do? I said, well, mm -hmm. well. I want to go in the studio and watch the session drummers play these parts that I came up with, and I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to get better. Yeah, I'm going to get better. I'll benefit from that because I'm your drummer, like you just said. Uh, that'll be good for you, right? Mm. Silence. And the whole band <laughs> is smoking. 
They're smoking cigarettes going like, holy shit. Where is this going? <laughs> and finally, I just went, well, well, fuck, you don't have to pay me anything. I'll just be for free and I'll sleep on the floor. <laughs> no problem. Sure. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I mean, one employer doesn't love hearing I'll work for free. Yeah, so, yeah. The bottom line is I did. I learned a lot, man. I, I watched. I took notes. I talked to the drummers. I played some vibes and percussion on the out record. I was embarrassed. I felt so out of it. I felt like, you know, like I'd just been taken off the team and I'm on the bench and I have to wait. So I mm-hmm. go home. I put together a new plan. The plan was I had to learn how to play simple. I had to, I had to learn how to play like Charlie Watts. I was trying to play yeah. like Billy Cobham up at that point or Neil Peart or somebody mm-hmm. with more technique. I, it was like I was looking through a telescope, which is amazing. But now I had to look through a microscope, which is a completely different world, but just as amazing. So Mm -hmm. I go home and the the trick is, how do you practice playing simple? I mean, (laughs) technique, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, what is that? So all I could do is listen to ACDC, listen to like John Bonham playing when the uh, songs like uh, Cashmere, listen to Creedence Clearwater, uh, listen to the Rolling Stones, listen to pop music understand why are they playing like that why does that work how does that work you know and so i did i set up an eight hour practice routine and i made a vow i'd be on the next record well the next record was two years later i had to Mm. i kept practicing and i even started practicing left-handed to get simpler Mm -hmm. anyway the next record long story short hardest record i've ever made People got fired. I almost got a fist fight with the guy. I didn't realize the guy was about to lose his record deal. It was horrible. It was Mm -hmm. a horrible, tough, very, very strenuous record. So one day I walk in and the co-producers got this metal box. I went, hey, Don, what's that? He said, oh, this is a Lin-1 drum machine. Like, Mm. drum machine? Yeah. Doesn't that replace drummers? Yeah. (laughs) You know, well, the Bee Gees are using it. It's the new thing. It's the new sound. It's it's kind of got this cool sound and I'm like, well, what are you doing with it? He says, well, we're going to use it on this song that we're having trouble with. I went, I'm being replaced by a machine. I'm like, fuck that. I grabbed the box, grabbed the, 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 uh, the manual and I'm well, yeah. I'm going to program it. So I programmed kind of what I was playing on the drums. I give it back to them. And then I'm like in the lounge going, oh my God. <laughs> Drummers are getting replaced by machines now. Yeah. What is happening? Oh, oh my God, I should have stayed in Israel. Anyway, <laughs> so, two hours later, I get called into the control room and the boss says, uh, we need a drum part after the second chorus. This machine only works up to here. and You got to come up with a drum solo. And I'm like, I'm excited and terrified. Excited because I'm going to be on the record terrified like oh my god what am i gonna play Mm -hmm. i have to save the song to save my career it's like Mm -hmm. this is it because i got fired last time all right (laughs) thank god we're spending the whole day setting up drums they didn't put drums in big rooms back then they put them in vocal booths so they could control the sound now we got the drums in the big room so got the close mics overhead mics but they didn't know where to put the room mics you put mm-hmm. them up high, you put them up low. Is it 15 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet? What are the acoustics of the room? Not to mention the chain, the, what preamps are they going? What kind of compression? What kind of EQs? We spent a whole day on that. And that whole time I was thinking, what are you going to play, Kenny? <laughs> All I knew is I had to come up with something that served the song. Yeah. Serve the style of the music. Something that's going to be great that comes out of little speakers on TVs, radios, uh, you know, uh, jukeboxes, right. and car stereos. And so it's finally, it's time for me to do it. And so I came up with the, the machines going, goose, 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 ka, goose. I go, boom, blam, kick drum, mm-hmm. snare drum. That's it. Boom, blam. And I stop. Mm-hmm. And I look in the control room and nine people are going, all right. And I'm going, <laughs> And I'm going, holy shit, you still got your job, Kenny. Now what? <laughs> so everybody goes down the drums. So I thought I'll go up the drums and I hit a dead end. And now it's like I come in there and, and I'm freaking, I'm terrified. I can still feel it. And they're going, 
try this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, this, this, this. And I'm like, my head's spinning and I'm thinking, I start heading back and I go, all right, you're on your own. Remember I told you, you're on your yeah. own. He says, you're the one that's going to save your ass. It's you. It's up to you. Don't look to anybody but you. So at 40 feet, I'm like, what are you going to play at 30 feet? I don't know. 20 feet. What are you going to play, Kenny? You're going to lose your fucking job. 10 feet. I don't know. Zero feet. I sit down. I look at the drums. I look at them. I look at the drums. I look at them. And I went, bing. I go, okay. All right. Don't start from scratch. Take something that you were already doing and kind of look at it in a different way. Remember I said mm-hmm. that at the beginning? Take the same idea. It'd almost be like if you had a room full of furniture. You can't stand the way it looks. You have two choices. Get rid of the furniture, buy new furniture, or take the furniture you already have and just mix it up. Change yeah. it around. That's what I did. So I took mm-hmm. what I was doing and rearranged it and blah, blah, blah. Long and short of it, that ended up being John Cougar Mellon Camp's Jack and Diane, which yeah. made biggest number one hit single he's ever had completely blew his career up launched my career it was almost like i was in the world series and they put me in and it's a ninth inning full count bases mm-hmm. loaded, you either strike out go home or hit a home run and you're the hero yeah and i hit a home run so long story but that is how that's my journey from classical music to rock and roll, and you already heard the story about getting into session work. Yeah. The, these are, and as you said to at the beginning, it was all, nothing was a walk through the park. Nothing was easy. It was just living life. It's what any person does to become successful and stay successful. It's that, it's that simple. It's just, it's life, man. Life is about losses. It's who can deal with the losses and move on. Getting Mm. fired, divorces, getting a broken leg. This happens, that happens. COVID-19 happens. That's a loss. It's how you deal with it. How you deal with it. Losses, it's not like woe is me. It's like, that's life. Move on. You get knocked down, can you get back up again? Yeah, and there's going to be people there stepping on you as you're trying to get up. And don't be crying and saying, oh, woe is me. No. And by the way, this is not in the same subject you just I wrote in my book. Not everybody deserves a trophy. If you can't yeah. get up, you don't get a trophy. Sorry, mm-hmm. that's life. Yeah. I'm not I'm not into the hand look at this winners and losers. You want to be right. a winner, fight fight harder. 